throughout the timeline of life, there are unexplainable moments. Moments where we find help, provision, and salvation in ways that are beyond natural. Perhaps these moments are the fingerprint of God. Perhaps these moments, big or small, are miracles. Good morning, everybody. So glad to be here with you all today at the real Super Bowl. Amen. <laughs> God is here in a big, big way. Uh, I have not asked your permission, but I'm going to brag on you all for a little bit. I'm not even going to ask if that's all right, because I'm going to do it. Uh, so we've been talking about everyday miracles, and miracles we've been talking about don't just occur as big supernatural phenomena, you know, where God just lightning bolt comes down or the proverbial hand of God reaches through the atmosphere. They're a little more subtle and a little more organic than that, but nevertheless powerful. And I see at work in all of you these everyday miracles. I, I see stories all the time and hear stories of the things that God is doing through you. For example, we had a, a church member in the hospital this week, and y'all just organized to make sure that somebody was there with her as round the clock as we could get. You know, there was the power of God's presence there. It wasn't just about showing up. It was about what she needed, right, to feel assurance, to feel faith, to feel secure. You pointed her to God. Now, others of you go with others to their treatments and to their appointments. You provide presence. You provide steadfastness. You provide friendship. That leads to greater things. That is not a small thing by any means. You provide meals for people who are coming home from the hospital. And it's not just about the food and helping somebody in their time of need. It's about that presence that leads to prayer and leads people to these deeper, deeper places. You all are a part of that. And I see the things that you pay attention to just recently uh, our shelters here in League City were designated as no-kill shelters. That's because you're passionate. You pay attention to what's going on with animals in our community, and that is no small feat. That came from you taking something seriously that you're paying attention to. And I want to give God the glory for all the ways that he works through all of you all the time. I could go on and on, but I know that there's something of a big game later on today, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and, and dig deeper into God is leading us toward. So we had a personal experience of this in my own family when we moved here a few years ago. Uh, shortly after, about three months after we, we moved into our home here and I became the pastor of the watershed, uh, Rachel started having these mystery pains, my wife, and it led to months of doctor's visits and then a surgery. And we, we weren't connected. I mean, I was pastor, so I was meeting a lot of people, but we weren't well connected in the church yet. And just on a, a real personal level, you all came and surrounded us with love and with support. Uh, people texted and called and checked in on us and provided meals and prayer for us. And, and folks even came to help with our firstborn who was still really small. Rachel couldn't lift more than a, a few pounds after her surgery. And people came and helped hold the baby and take care of him when I had to be out doing things like that. And it was because of, of your commitment that we got further connected. That led to a, a relationship with a deeper group that we we were with for years before that group multiplied and and god grew it but it was because of just those small steps to meet a tangible physical need in our life that led to a deeper spiritual connection with christ and led to conversations we were able to have with you all that led us deeper in our faith i mean do you see get a taste of this that the little things that you feel are insignificant have deep significance in the eyes of god the, the little things that you take your time to do lead to even greater spiritual breakthrough for people. And it's important to not minimize those opportunities that God gives you every day to do good, to make a difference, to lean into somebody's life and somebody's need. That's what we're going to talk about today as we look at everyday miracles. So far in this series, we've said that, that God has always been a God of miracles. It, all the way back to the Old Testament days, God worked through the prophets to help enlarge the faith of the people, to show something of who God is to the people around. And obviously, Jesus is an obvious place we go when we talk about miracles. I mean, being the Son of God, He did a lot that showed God's supernatural power breaking into this order. But today we take a turn, and this is where it gets really personal, because the prophets of the Old Testament weren't the only ones that performed miracles, and Jesus certainly wasn't the only one. But Jesus' disciples also performed miracles. God enacted great and powerful miracles through the disciples. 
And so we're turning today to the book of Acts, and we're going to see the way that, that Jesus' power worked through the disciples to bring people to faith. It's, it's extraordinary. In John 14, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his own crucifixion, and he's preparing them to continue the ministry that he had begun during his time on earth. And this is what he says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Look at that. Keep that up there for just a second. Do you see that? I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Have you ever paused and pondered that in the Scriptures? I mean, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Church, he's talking to you. If you believe, Jesus says, you will do the works that Jesus did. But even more, look at this. They will do even greater things than these. What? We'll do even greater works than Jesus himself? Is that what he's telling us here? Well, we have to turn to the book of Acts to begin to dig into what that really, really means. In Luke, during his ministry as part of training the disciples, Jesus sends his disciples out to cast out demons and to heal diseases. So Jesus is serious about those called disciples who follow him doing great things in his name that make the power of God manifest in this world. So that means that, that we're all miracle workers, right? We're all miracle workers. Jesus intends to work through each and every one of us to help others experience the presence and power of God. Do you believe this? I mean, these are Jesus' words in John 14. And I think the church needs to come alive and come awake. Because if this is truly our call, if this is truly Jesus' intent for his body, the church, man, there's... There's no stopping what the Spirit can do when we awaken to the presence and the power of God. So today, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 3 to study the first miracle that, that Jesus worked through the disciples after the day of Pentecost. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to follow along. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11. And as you're turning there, I want to give you just a little bit of background because it's important to what we're going to study here in just a moment. So in Acts chapter 1, this is after the resurrection, Jesus has spent... 40 days on earth teaching after he was raised from the dead. Acts 1, you see the ascension. Jesus goes up into heaven and tells the disciples to wait for power from on high. So Jesus goes up into heaven. The disciples are standing there looking up in the sky, and God sends an angel to say, why are you just standing there looking up? Jesus will come back one day just as he said, but the implication is get busy, right? You've got work to do. So we turn to chapter 2. And the disciples had gathered in a house, and they were praying, and they were waiting on the gift that Jesus promised before he was ascended into heaven. And we call this the day of Pentecost. All of a sudden, as they were praying, all heaven breaks loose, right? See what I did there? All heaven breaks loose. Uh, the tongues of fire rest on the heads of the disciples, and they begin preaching the gospel in the languages of all the people that had gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. Thousands were saved that day through the message that was given through the power of the Holy Spirit to all who were gathered there. And so those who were baptized said, what next? What do we do? And so the disciples said, look, come and hear our teaching. Pray daily. Continue to worship God at the temple and break bread together in one another's homes. And at the end of Acts 2, it says that they did that. The first Christian converts lived into that rhythm and God added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. This is important to know as we dig into chapter 3. Let's begin with verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. All right, let's pause there. No miracle has happened yet, but do you notice that Peter and John practice what they preach? What were they doing? They were going up to the temple to pray. Right? It's the same thing just verses earlier that they had told the first Christian converts to do. Devote yourselves to our teaching, to prayer, to worship in the temple. And so during this time, prayer was offered three times a day, morning, noon, and night. This is the time of the evening sacrifice and evening prayer. And they're doing exactly what they were teaching the new converts to do. They were devoted to God. Now notice, in John 14, Jesus says, if you believe, then you will do the works that I did. Indeed, you will do even greater works than these. 
So how do we believe? Believe comes from prayer and devotion to God. Spending time with God enlarges our trust in God. The, the study of God's word, the worship of God allows us to continue to give thanks on the mountains, in the valleys. I don't know about y'all, but I'm so grateful for our calendar. I'm so grateful that worship comes, whether we feel like it or not, every single Sunday, right? Because sometimes I feel like worshiping, right? I feel like giving God thanks and praise because things are going really well. Sometimes I would rather just get out, stay in my bed and not get out of the house. But yet I need to come to worship anyway. Because it's sometimes when I'm in the valley and I worship, it lifts my eyes up to God and God shows me something that I needed to see that I wouldn't have seen otherwise, right? We worship whether we feel like it or not. And through worship, God takes us to a better place. Amen? And so these disciples were going to pray and to worship God in the temple, which brings us to our first observation about miracles. Don't miss this. Miracles are unleashed by prayer and devotion to God. Miracles are unleashed by prayer and devotion to God. Because Jesus says, if you believe, you will do the works that I have done, even greater works than these. But it starts with belief, and belief is heightened through prayer and worship and devotedness to our Father. Well, something else was going here too, like clockwork. Uh, there was a man, as Peter and John are going into the temple, there was a man who had been unable to walk from birth, who was about my age, near 40, and he was carried every day by his friends and laid at the temple gates like clockwork. And we can't miss what's going on here. This man had no ability to support himself except through the generosity and piety of those who worship God. I mean, the law was clear. He could only go so far in his relationship with God. Leviticus uh, tells us the law that he was beholden to. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, for the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hand. The law forbade this man who was born unable to walk from going into where the presence of God was said to dwell on earth, the place where the sacrifices were made. But he got as close as he could get every single day. And without fail, he was there expectant that he would make at least enough money off of the generosity of others going to daily prayer to be able to get his next meal. Right, so we see two things coming to play here. The devotion of the disciples and the needs of this man are coming together in this holy moment. So let's continue on in Acts 3. When this man saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. But Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. So let's keep that up there for just a moment. Look closely at the number of times this brief passage talks about seeing or paying attention to. See if you can count. Some of it's veiled a little bit in the English. Anybody have your answer? What do you think? Oh, don't be bashful. Five, close. Four. Yeah, four. So there's something operating here in the Greek, and I, I hope I'm not going to bore you too much, but it's important to know because English can encapsulate what is really going on in the scene, and it's important for our understanding of miracles. So let's break this down. The first thing that happened is the man who was born unable to walk sees Peter and John walking toward the temple, to the place of prayer, to the place of sacrifice. That word in Greek is orao. It means he saw with his eyes. So he, he looked up and saw them entering. That, that's the first step, right? He's trying to engage with them, orao. It's very surface level. But then this is interesting. The disciples looked even deeper than that. Look at this next word that we have. Atenizo, to fix one's eyes upon. It said that Peter and John looked at the man. So the man saw them, Peter and John looked at him, right? Atenizo, what does that word sound like in English? Attention, attentiveness, right? The disciples, don't miss this, 
Peter and John gave their attention to the man who was unable to walk. This is to fix one's mind upon. Now, if you give a fleeting glance to something, you're not going to think about it much, right? I mean, I, I am attentive to my children unless they're talking incessantly and I just have to get some stuff done, right? Just kidding, kind of. Uh, Atenizo. But, but when they have a need, I'm all in, right? Nothing's going to pull me away when they're crying or they've hurt themselves. Atenizo, right? All of my focus and attention is fixed on what they need. That is the sense of this word. Peter and John were attentive. They fixed their mind on this guy, right? The guy just looked, looked up and saw, but they saw something beneath the surface. They didn't just see his need for money. They saw something even deeper in his soul that needed attending to. Atenizo. You think God could use more Christians who atenizo? That focus and pay attention, fix their mind's eye on something that God cares about? We're going to come back to that in just a moment. The third word for seeing is blepo, to discover or understand. So Peter tells the man, look up, look at us, blepo, understand us. Something's about to happen here that transcends what you were expecting, right? Discover, understand what it is that we're about to do. Look up, blepo. So there's number three. And then here's the fourth. The man fixed his attention on them. Uh, Apexo, right? Apexo is the word in Greek. It means to attend to. And this is, hey, I'm about to get something here. I better pay attention, right? It's not, not quite the level of fixing your mind on something, but it's uh, about to get something I need right? Like the kid, when you say snack time, ebeko, right? That's what's going on there. They're coming, they're opening up the pantry, trying to open the goldfish. That's the sense of that word. They're not going deeper, right? This is still surface level, but you've got my attention is what's going here, right? So think about what's going on here. This man, day after day, 40 years of his life has come to beg in the temple. Now, Peter and John, when they paid attention to him, fixed their mind's eye on him, they didn't see a man who just needed his dinner, right? They saw a man who by no choice of his own was excluded from the prayer and worship life of his community. By law, he could not go through the gate into the place where the sacrifices were made, where people could pray, where the presence of God was said to dwell. Do you see this? It's no choice of his own. And, and they had probably observed as they were walking up, pious people who were told by their law to make gifts to God and give alms to the poor, doing what we do, right? Either out of pity, dropping some money right in front of his face or just turning away so that they didn't have to look upon him. And if you don't look, then, you know, I don't see you, I don't see you, so you're not there. You know, my kids do this all the time. I don't know what it is when we see the homeless person on the street corner, if we pretend not to look, like we adjust the radio, we pick up our phones, which we shouldn't be doing in the car until the light turns green and then go, we don't have to deal with that need, right? That's a whole other sermon that I will preach one day about why we do that and because it's, it's important for us to understand but just know that that's what had happened for this man some saw his need gave him a handout others just ignored him altogether and these were the pious people going into the place of prayer but peter and john atenizo they fixed their mind's eye upon them and they saw the brokenness that existed beneath the surface they saw what this man really needed which leads us to the second observation about miracles that you cannot miss Miracles become possible by paying attention. Miracles become possible by paying attention. So that gives me pause to think, what is it that you're paying attention to these days? Is it your phone? Is it just your work or your daily tasks? Or is it the people that God has placed all around you? What are you fixing your mind's eye upon? What are you attending to? What are you... What are you thinking about beneath the surface? I'm going to tell you that, that prayer and devotion to God lead to the place that we attend to the things that we need to be attending to. And if Peter and John hadn't been in that ritual, that, that rhythm of living where they're praying and where they're reading the scriptures and where they're worshiping God, their mind's eye might not have been open to be able to be fixed on this man and his need. But see, miracles are made possible by paying attention. The man was paying attention in as much as he could. He saw that Peter and John offered him so much more than a handout. And that's where we turn as we continue reading. 
Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Okay, this is extraordinary what happens here. So this man, you know, he's, he's attentive, right? I'm going to get my snack, my kids would think. And Peter goes, silver and gold I do not have. And can you imagine this man who's used to either getting a little or being ignored? I bet the air left his balloon a little bit in that moment, like, are you kidding me? I mean, I gave you my attention. My stomach started growling. I thought you were going to give me goldfish. But yet you're saying you have no goldfish to give. What? That's what's going on here in this moment. Silver and gold I do not have. Here's what's interesting. There's something going on with the gate here. I know this is odd talking about gates in the middle of a sermon, but it's important because the gate's mentioned several times, and it's called beautiful. And in the English translation, it's given a capital B, but nobody really knows which gate that was. Commentators have studied this for centuries, and they can't figure out exactly where this gate is because nobody really wrote about it. There wasn't a gate called beautiful anywhere. And so, you know, some just say, well, well Luke never actually attended the temple, so what does he know? And I, There's something way more than that going on here. So we have to understand something about the temple. This is important. When we think temple, we probably think church, right? The building where you walk in and there's a sanctuary, you go through the doors and boom, you're there. The temple worked a little differently. It was, a lot of it was open air. Uh, the only closed in part was the Holy of Holies, you know, the, the inner sanctuary where only the priests could go. But there was a series of courtyards. So this is going to be important in just a minute, I promise you. Stick with me. And so you go in through these series of gates. So you go up to the temple. You go into the courtyard of the Gentiles. And well, if you weren't a practicing Jew, that's as far as you could go. Then you walk through another series of gates, and you were in what they called the court of the women. And this wasn't to say that only women were allowed. It was to say this is as far as the women in this day and age could go. Thank God we've busted through those gates since then, right? But that's, that was the deal. And then only Israelite men could go through the, the next set of gates into the court of the Israelites, which was right outside the temple that you could walk in, right? The Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary. And that's where sacrifices were made to God and prayers were offered. And so this gate called Beautiful, it was believed, was the gate that led from the court of the women into the court of the Israelites. This man got as close as he could get to the presence of God on earth, right? Because that place where sacrifices were made, that inner sanctuary, that holy of holies, was the place where the presence of God was said to dwell upon the earth. And so he literally was asked to be placed as close as he could get to God, as close as the law would allow. So do you see what's going on here? This man has an openness. He wants to be closer to God than the law will allow him to. He wants these pious worshipers to come and offer something more to him than just a handout, right? There's something expectant here. And here is this man that the world might not call beautiful in front of a gate called beautiful. I don't think Luke's messing around with us here. I think Luke knows exactly what he talks about because this man is beautiful to God. He's beautiful to God. And these disciples, Atenizo, they saw him. They understood something about what was going on and about this brokenness that existed, this man who longed to worship and this man who longed to pray with the people but was excluded because of his, his disability. He longed for somebody to pay attention to him in front of this gate called Beautiful. Forty years, my whole lifetime, right? His whole adult life. He was begging for his next meal. And here's Peter saying, silver and gold I do not have. There's one more thing I want to say about that, speaking of gates. This is really important. All of the other gates in the temple were not very valuable, but they were gilded by silver and gold. So they had this veneer of great value. But if you stripped off the precious metals that were around the not-so-precious metal, you didn't have anything of great value. However... This gate called Beautiful was believed to have been placed there by King Herod, and it was made of Corinthian bronze, far more valuable than the, the plated gates that were in the rest of the temple. So think about that for just a moment. As Peter looks around at these, the veneer of worth 
on these other gates in front of the gate called Beautiful, made of Corinthian bronze, the most valuable gate of all. He says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you. Christians are so quick to throw money at things. Have you ever noticed that? And there's a need. We'll open up our wallet. We'll toss money at it. We'll feel great. Man, look what we... And we even... Uh, and I, I, we do this all the time, and I'll still do it again, you know, the whole, we help 15,000 people through our school supply drive, right? But yeah, we help the kid go to school, but what did, they're still going to be hungry when they go home, maybe, or, you know, what are the issues leading to the need for the school supplies, right? Christians, and it's necessary, and it's helpful, but we're so quick to throw money at things. But what you have is more valuable than money. Do you see this? What you have is more valuable than money. Your time is of greater worth than any money that you have to throw at any situation. And in this moment, Peter is trying to say, this gate may be beautiful, but I'm about to give you something of greater value than that. We say time is money in our culture, and in the business world it is. The, the way you spend your time translates into dollars, but for Christians, time is way more valuable than money. It's costly. It takes a while to be with people. It takes a while to see their needs met. Which brings us to our next observation. Miracles are heightened by helping someone. Miracles are heightened by helping someone. And to help someone, to truly help someone, it takes time. It takes attentiveness. It, it matters what you're paying attention to. So here's what happened next. Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Now, I'm sure this guy goes, what? I have never walked in my life. I have been this way since birth. And does Peter just stand off at a distance or wait from the proverbial hand of God to bust through the atmosphere and pick him up and psh, like he levitates up? He's like, whoa, you know, I'm walking. No, how is he healed? Peter reaches out a hand and helps him up. You see that? Eye contact, time, attentiveness helps him up. And, and Luke, pay attention to this. Luke, the physician, gives us an orderly account of how he's healed. So read that on your own. You know, his ankles began to be strengthened and his feet were stronger. I mean, the physician really goes to work here. So as he was being helped up, that's when he got strong. And this was amazing. He didn't just walk. What did he do? He started jumping and leaping. I mean, this man had never even walked before. And he's praising God right here in this place in front of the gate called Beautiful. Do you see? Do you see this? And there's one more thing. Now, I say that miracles are heightened by helping, but also by walking with somebody for a while. Peter and John don't just walk away from this man. They walk with him into the place of prayer. They, they connect him to a community that he has longed to be connected to. They lead him into the presence of God because the physical healing isn't the end of the story. It's the spiritual breakthrough and healing that's the whole purpose behind what's going on. And all of this, the people saw and they responded. And it's in response to a prophecy in Isaiah, which says, check this out. Then, that's when the Messiah comes, when this new age dawns, the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. You know something about this miracle? This is not the first time we read of it. Jesus' very first miracle after he selected the, the first disciples, was healing a man born unable to walk. The disciples' first miracle in Acts, after the first Christian converts to the church, healing a man born unable to walk. Paul's first miracle after his come to Jesus moment on the road to Damascus, healing a man unable to walk. And they all leaped like a deer after they'd been unable to walk before. You see this? There's something very specific going on here. A new age is dawning, and the power is not from us, it's from God. Because it was in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that he was healed, not of the disciples' power. It wasn't because of Peter that this man could walk. Because in this day and age, to do something in the name of somebody else was to, to do it in their power, as if they were standing in for you. It, it's, it's just like this prayer, when we're baptized into Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Right? It's the power of Jesus at work within the disciples that allows this man to walk. 
Let's finish the story. It's so good. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. There they mentioned the gate again. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. That's the, by the way, all the miracle stories that we've done, studied so far, the people respond with wonder and amazement, the sense of awe that something transcendent has happened. And look at this very last verse. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished. And look, they came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. The people came running to Peter and John. And this man that they knew had been lame from birth, they didn't just walk, they ran when they saw what God was going to do. Which leads us to our fourth and final observation. Miracles are made manifest in physical healing in order to bring about spiritual healing. Miracles are made manifest in physical healing to bring about spiritual healing. One commentator says that healing is worthless if it doesn't lead to the healing of the soul. Right? This man's response was worship, and the people's response was awe and wonder. The Spirit, through healing this man, allowed the opportunity for Peter to preach the real reason that this happened, and thousands of people committed their lives to following Christ that day. The real miracle here is that because Peter and John paid attention to this man, all of the people gathered to pray, to pray and to praise God, paid attention to the God who had been in their midst all along, but they had failed to see up to this point. You see that? So let's review as we begin to bring this to a close. Miracles are unleashed by prayer and devotion to God. Miracles become possible by paying attention. Miracles are heightened by helping someone up and walking with them. And miracles are made manifest in physical healing in order to bring about spiritual healing. Friends, I know you. I know that you are people who want to make a difference and change the world. That's why you're here. The Watershed is a church who serves. We're a church that seeks to make a difference. We are difference makers who want to make a difference in the world. But you've got to be devoted to prayer and to worship, even when you don't feel like it, because that's what enlarges our belief and our faith and trust in God and provides the, the platform that miracles begin to be performed upon. We've got to pay attention to those that God has placed around us. We can't just give little fleeting glances here and there, but we've got to actually see and understand the brokenness that lies beneath the surface so that we're moved to act and do something about it. We've got to offer a helping hand. And we've got to walk with people for a while, which takes time. It's more than just dropping a, a coin in the cup of the homeless person as you drive by, but it actually might mean pulling over and sitting and putting your arm around him for a while and having a conversation and a prayer, right? And fourth, physical healing leads to something spiritual. People are truly healed when they're led into the presence of God and connected with the community of faith. And unless we do all of that, we're not going to make the kind of difference that we want to make. And so I ask you once again, church, what is it that you're paying attention to? Because what you're truly attentive to has eternal significance, and it might just transform the world.